Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us, depending on where you are in the world here today. Uh, we sincerely appreciate it. First, I do want to thank Brian from On One uh, for asking us to uh, kind of join him and get together for this for this webinar. You know, um, it's really common. We were sitting around probably, I don't know, maybe a month ago, and we were just kind of chatting about stuff, and we were talking about both of our company's webinar efforts, and we were sharing comments that came back and forth from different attendees saying, you know, I use this application, I use this plugin, this tool, that tool and you know, obviously there's a lot of synergy between our companies between our products so really excited to share with you hopefully some practical uh, ideas and understandings as to how both products complement one another and how you can get more out of both of them when used together so uh, so our agenda is pretty straightforward today we've got a lot of stuff to cover um, I have uh, put together a sort of a basic agenda at first um, we're really gonna be talking about exactly what a tablet is I mean for a lot of people new users non-users altogether, there's sometimes some misconceptions as to what a tablet does and, and how it works. So we're going to talk about some very basic things at first, and then we're going to take a look at how a tablet functions and really what the big deal is, uh, and I like to call it that. What What's the big deal about tablet use? And so we're going to talk about pressure sensitivity, the use of the pen, which is really one of the primary reasons why you'd want to take a look at a tablet in the first place. And then we're going to talk about some of the tools within some applications that you use and help you understand how it is that those tools are enhanced when you use a pressure sensitive pen. We're going to talk about a couple different things that you can do with the tablet itself, ways in which you can increase your productivity, uh, improve your, your workflow, dare I say that word. Uh, it's sort of a, um, well, I guess it's sort of a vague thing nowadays, but, uh, but basically what I mean is I'm going to show you some ways in which you can improve the process that you go through to enhance your images. We're going to take a couple of questions um, as we segue over to our second presenter, which was Brian, who you heard from just a few moments ago. And Brian's going to be going over uh, some other things within uh, within both Photoshop, but really more so the um, the perfect photo suite. So when Brian comes over, he's going to be speaking specifically to uh, a couple of different plugins within the suite, Photo Tools, Focal Point specifically, uh, as well as some of the other things that um, come with the uh, perfect photo suite. Um, he's probably going to talk about spelling, uh, which is, uh, uh, <laughs> as I look at my, the way I've spelled enhancement, uh, image enhancement, he's going to be talking about ways in which you can mask with precision. and you can basically get more control of your masks. Many people, um, you know, approach masking in a lot of different ways. Some people, you know, hit it with a hammer and you can completely tell just how, uh, you know, where somebody's been. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a runner uh, and, and former mountain biker and there's this kind of term that we keep in mind and it's called tread lightly. Uh, you know, you want to, you want to, you want to be careful not to ruin the trails that you're running on. And that's kind of the same kind of philosophy I approach my image enhancement and retouching. You know, there's nothing worse than looking at an image and saying, well, that was Photoshopped or that was that or this was this, you know. So you want somebody to simply appreciate the image for what it is. So you're going to see a lot of things from Brian as to how you can enhance your images effectively uh, and with precision and uh, hopefully great results. And then finally, we're going to leave some uh, time at the end of our webinar today to answer some questions and make sure we get some things uh, addressed for you there. So that said, that's our agenda. I'm going to go ahead and jump right in. Again, as I mentioned before, some sort of basic things in mind. I'm first going to start out talking about the tablet that I'm using today, some of the features that are specific to our, our presentation today. So with that, uh, this is the Intuos 4 Medium Tablet, uh, by far one of Wacom's most popular tablets for photographers, uh, retouchers, designers, etc. Um, so this is what I'm going to be using here today, and uh, I want to point out a couple of major features that you should be familiar with. Now, of course, when we talk about pens, or excuse me, when we talk about tablets, we, we first think of the pen. I mean, that is really the primary input, if you will, the means in which you're going to move your, move your cursor around the screen. It's also the tool that you're going to use to increase the effectiveness and usefulness of the tools that you already use today. And in fact, you know what I'd like to do is I'd like to give everybody a, a much better look at this. Right here at the end of the pen is, of course, the pen tip. Now, for many people, uh, this might be redundant. It might be uh, um, kind of a little too basic. But funny enough, when you're using a pen, you want to use it just like you would a ballpoint pen. You want to hold the pen in your hand just like you would a pen, a pencil, you know, what have you. The pen tip is essentially your mouse click. So if you wanted to select something, you would simply tap on it. 
if you wanted to open something up, you would double tap on it. There's a little button right there on the side of the pen. That button has two different functions, a kind of a forward and a backward position. What you can do here is you can set this front button up for one function and the back up for another. This is the way I'd like you to think of it, at least starting out. Here's your mouse button right here. This is your, your click, your left click, if you will, the pen tip. The front button of my pen uh, is a right click, and the back button is set up for a double click. Now, I actually go in and change this function within specific applications that I'll address a little bit later on when we get into the tablet control panel, but just keep that in mind. One of my absolute favorite features of this pen, of course, is its little eraser right here in the back. This is the eraser just like you'd find on the back of a, a good old number two pencil. All you got to do is simply flip this pen over and it's going to perform an erasing like function. Okay, you know again we're, we're talking about the pen again that's really the uh, the primary reason why people look towards tablets to, uh, to to gain greater control in their applications but it's not just about pens. In fact most recently Tablets like the Intuos 4 Medium that I'm using here and its previous generation Intuos 3 incorporate things such as express keys and touch rings. Those express keys are these physical buttons right down here at the bottom underneath my magnifying glass. These are physical buttons that can be assigned common keyboard shortcuts and functions. So with your non-dominant hand, a simple one button click can perform a function. With the Intuos 4 Medium, you've got eight keys in all that can be assigned individual keyboard shortcuts within all of your applications or not at all depends on your workflow but again we'll talk about these a little bit later on uh, also is that ring that I was mentioning that's this physical uh, ring right here all you simply have to do is run your finger or your thumb right around that ring and you can do things such as zoom in or out of an image increase or decrease a brush size four functions in all actually so we'll talk about that as well but again, this is my Intuos 4 medium. Let me go ahead and put my magnifying glass away. If you are uh, new to Wacom or new to tablets, again, this is by far Wacom's most popular pen tablet and the one ideally designed for creative professionals, photographers, and those that are really serious about their photography. Okay, how do you set this thing up? Well, this is the way that I have my tablet set up on my desk. Now, for a lot of people, um, this can be a little bit awkward at first. Uh, for others, this is just right. Now, I say that this is the way I have my tablet set up on my desk, and, and I'm going to contradict myself, and I'm going to I'm going to tell you not to do this. In fact, <laughs> but this is the way I typically have my tablet set up. Uh, I have my keyboard pushed off to the side a little bit, and my tablet off to the other side. So I kind of split the display down the middle, if you will. You know, in terms of positioning my keyboard and my tablet on my desk. Now, that said, I'm going to talk about how the tablet works. Um, and then again, change your uh, uh, suggest that you change the position of your tablet at least temporarily. This is what I typically recommend to people that are new to tablets or just getting started using their tablet. You know, a tablet works a little bit differently than a mouse does. It works in what we call absolute mode, meaning where you put your pen on the tablet is exactly where your cursor is going to appear on your display. So, for example, if we take a look at this, I've got my pen on my tablet here. Uh, if I were or, uh, wanting to navigate, what I would do is this. I have my tablet kind of hovering above, or excuse me, I have my pen hovering above the tablet. When you're in this absolute mode, which, it's his, which is its default mode, when you hold your pen over the tablet, roughly a quarter of an inch or so, depending on where your pen is, or depending on, uh, I should say, depending on where your pen is in proximity on your tablet, uh, your cursor will appear. So, for example, if I were to pick my pen up and move it in the upper left-hand corner, my cursor is going to appear in the upper left-hand corner. If I were to pick it up and kind of navigate and hover right over here to the bottom right-hand corner, my cursor is going to immediately follow. And the reason why I point this out is because this is one of the biggest learning curves to getting used to using a tablet. Many people, for the very first time, they pick up their pen and they immediately think of it as a mouse and they start doing things like this. They start kind of picking it up and moving it and moving it and they're trying to get their cursor over to their toolbox and as they keep picking the pen up and kind of scrolling with it uh, like they would with a mouse they get frustrated because their cursor keeps jumping backwards again if I want you to think about it this way the active area of your tablet that's this whole area right down here that you draw on maps proportionally to your display so when you're moving your cursor resist that temptation to pick it up and scoot it along and just simply keep going so 
that's how you're going to navigate. You're hovering the pen above the tablet. It's not until you want to start drawing do you then touch your pen to the tablet. So for example, if I were to have my pen now touching the tablet, simply varying the amount of pressure as I move my pen across the tablet is going to do things such as increase or decrease the width of a brush or the opacity of a brush. So again, if you think of the pen tip as your left mouse click, when the pen tip is touching the tablet, it's just like you're clicking. And now that benefit again is the fact that you're using pressure sensitivity to gain a greater level of control over your tools. So with that said, let me do this. Let me switch over to Photoshop. And I've got a blank document here. What I was going to do is basically show you how this pressure sensitivity works. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're just going to talk about pressure and brushes. So I'm just kind of scrolling this little note here on my tablet. All right, so in fact, if you look at what I wrote there, you might even see some variation in the width of my brush. That's because the particular brush that I'm using is pressure sensitive, and I'm affecting the width of the brush based on how hard I physically press my pen to the tablet. Let me do this. Let me get my, I'm going to get my uh, documents, uh, or excuse me, my pan panels <laughs> back right over here. There we go. All right. And now we can all see my layers panel. All right, so what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to actually get rid of my little note, and I'm going to open up the brushes panel for a moment. Now, sometimes when I open this brushes panel uh, for photographers, uh, they, they look at this and they get a little bit nervous, because unless you're using a tablet, you probably don't spend a whole lot of time in this panel. But this is really what I consider the heart of the application. This is where you're going to take advantage of pressure sensitivity. So for example, if I had a brush selected, which I do, uh, right now, I can't really tell a whole lot about it. If I look down at my brush preview window down here, you can see that it's a fairly hard edge brush. If I were to uh, increase this brush size, and I can do this in a couple different ways, I could use the left and right bracket keys on my keyboard, or I could use the function on the tablet itself called the touch ring to adjust the brush size. Now, incidentally, you might have noticed on your screen there, there was this little heads-up display that was talking about um, a couple different options here. I'm continually hitting this button right in the center of that ring, as this allows me to toggle between four different functions. I'm continually hitting it, because if I stop, it's going to disappear. So I'm keeping it uh, on your screen by repeatedly hitting the button. But I want to adjust my brush size with this ring. So by selecting brush size, and now moving my cursor over here to the side, all I have to do is simply swipe my finger around this ring and you can see that I can dynamically increase or decrease the size of my brush. Okay, so I've got a fairly hard edge brush right here and if I were to draw a stroke on my tablet pressing very lightly and gradually pressing a little bit harder as I got towards the bottom, you can see that pressure is allowing me to increase the width of that brush. Now, that's all well and good, but as a photographer, rather than adjust the size of my brush with pressure, I prefer to adjust the opacity. So what I'm going to do here in my brushes panel is I'm going to uncheck shape dynamics and I'm going to tap on the words transfer. Now incidentally I'm using Photoshop CS5 here today and uh, regardless of what version of Photoshop you might be using um, some of these features are going to be in slightly uh, different places but it's going to function exactly the same way. So under transfer here you'll see that I've got a couple different controls opacity and flow. I'm going to turn control for opacity on for pen pressure. And I'm going to leave that up on your screen for a second and point something out. I'm using Photoshop for our demonstration here, but it's important to understand that a pen tablet will allow you to navigate with your cursor in any application, absolutely any application. At its simplest explanation, a tablet is little more than an input device, just like a mouse, a trackball, what have you. The benefit here, however, is pressure sensitivity. It enables you to work more intuitively by allowing you to adjust the tools that you already use today using pressure. The fact that this says pen pressure in here is due to the relationship that Wacom maintains with Adobe, the developer of Photoshop. At the same time, it's not just about these host applications, if you will. App developers such as On One have built in pressure sensitive controls that specifically take advantage of Wacom's pen tablet technology. And Brian's going to show you how that affects the uh, perfect photo suite in just a few moments. But anyways, I'm turning this pen pressure function on 
to show you that I can adjust the opacity. Now you'll see right down here again in my brush preview window, I've got kind of a stair-stepping sort of a look. That's because I still have that hard edge brush. What I want to do is change the hardness from 100% down here to 0%. And now you're going to see a really smooth transition from light to dark. So if I close that brush panel up and I get a slightly larger brush size, in the same exact motion that I drew the stroke right here, I'm going to press on my tablet very lightly and gradually press a little bit harder. And you can see that that opacity is now changing from very light to very dark. All right, now sometimes again, when I'm speaking to photographers, they say, wow, okay, well, that, that I guess makes sense. I understand what pressure does, but what's it going to do for me? Well, I'd like you to think about it this way. Um, anybody that's ever uh, done any traditional uh, darkroom development is probably familiar with the dodging and burning uh, concept. Uh, you're letting some light in or holding some light back to adjust the exposure. Well, that's kind of what I'm doing when I'm adjusting opacity. If I were to tab over to an image, what I'm doing here, or what I'm, what I'm going to do, is show you how this pressure-sensitive control can allow me to, um, well, kind of dodge and burn, if you will. But really, I'd like you to keep the, the overall, the high-level uh, uh, concept in mind. So I've got an image here that I'd like to adjust its tonal value. And I'm going to venture to bet that a great majority of the people on our webinar here have used a layer mask in the past. Uh, but if not, I'll explain it as I go along. What I'm simply going to do here is I'm going to set uh, I'm going to create a curves adjustment layer. Now, as I've done this in my layers panel, you'll notice that obviously nothing's changed. Uh, all I'm going to do here is I'm going to grab this new little feature right here in Photoshop CS5. This is a, um, well, I, I don't know what they call it exactly. Uh, let's, well, I guess they don't really call it anything. Well, maybe they do. But anyways, when you turn this little toggle on, what happens is you're enabled to uh, adjust your, your tone curve based on the image itself. So for example, if I wanted to darken up the background, all I have to do at this point is tap, and it's going to place a point on my curve, and it's going to drag it up or down based on uh, the, my pen to the tablet. So right now, I'm just going to drop it right about there. Now what I'm doing here is I'm paying very close attention to the background. I don't care what it's doing to my subject. Now what I will do is I will select my paintbrush, and you may recall in our brushes panel, we had turned transfer on and set control for opacity and flow to pen pressure. Now what I'm going to do is simply use that pressure sensitive control to paint back, mask out if you will, uh, hold back the curves adjustment only in the areas that I want. So essentially what I'm doing is here, here is I'm selectively applying the adjustment only in the areas that I want. And I want to bring it back, I want to bring back the original exposure on this model's face. Now if I were to look at the mask by itself for a moment by holding down the option or the alt key, tapping on the layer mask by itself, you'll see where I painted. Okay, uh, Not exactly the most attractive looking mask, but uh, essentially what's happening is this. White is revealing the adjustment, the curves adjustment if you will. Black, right here on her eyes, face, and a little bit around her, her hair, is holding the curves adjustment back, letting the original exposure show through. If I hold the shift key down, tap on this layer mask, I'll temporarily disable it. So there's the adjustment applied to the entire image, and there's the adjustment applied only to the background, again being held back by the mask. Pressure sensitivity, when combined with the layer mask that comes with your adjustment layer, gives you the basis of a technique that can be taken all sorts of different ways. So keep that in mind. I'm going to show you just a couple of other things here before I turn it over to Brian, but again, keeping in mind, pressure sensitivity is really the basis of a lot of the different techniques uh, that professional retouchers are applying. I'm going to zoom in on this young lady's face for a moment, and I'm going to, uh, let's see here, we'll go ahead and tap on the background layer. I'm actually going to create a new layer. And as you can look in my, uh, as you can see in my layers panel, I've got uh, underneath my adjustment this new layer right here. I'm going to select the spot healing brush. And incidentally, you know, I'm selecting a couple of these different brushes uh, for a reason. When you're using a pen in Photoshop or any application for that matter, you're able to take advantage of pen pressure using tools that have been designed specifically for use with that pen. So. Any tool in Photoshop, for example, that has brush-like functionality is most likely enabled for pen pressure. Um, well, I shouldn't say most likely. In Photoshop, 
all of them are. Uh, you've got over 20 pressure sensitive tools. So obviously I showed you my paintbrush tool uh, and I'm about to show you the spot healing brush, but uh, consider some of these other tools, your eraser, your, your, your clone stamp tool, your history brush, your art history brush, dodge, burn, sponge tools, all of those tools are literally brushes and thus take advantage of pressure sensitivity. Okay, so what I'm doing right here with the spot healing brush is I'm simply going to go over some of the elements uh, that I'd like to heal. And in that case, that happens to be some of these uh, wrinkles on this young lady's forehead, you know, perhaps uh, a couple of marks that were uh, sort of being revealed through her makeup, uh, perhaps her freckles, acne, what have you. You'll notice right here in these laugh lines, I'm going to press very lightly and gradually press a little bit harder. And you see how that brush stroke kind of fans out a little bit. When you're using the spot healing brush, pressure sensitivity is affecting the size of the brush. And here's a little tip for you when you're using this kind of a brush. You really only want to use as absolutely large a brush as necessary to cover the area in which you're healing. You know, you, if you've ever used this brush before, you've probably found that it's pretty simple uh, and, and pretty common to create sort of a scarring effect by simply uh, uh, using too large a brush. So that's why I try to use as absolutely small a brush as possible uh, so that I don't create that kind of a scarring effect. And just kind of you know getting a little bit of lines away here. Now what I what I didn't mention uh, incidentally is that I created a new layer and when I heal underneath eyes I tend to do that so that I can lower the opacity uh, of that layer in the event that I do create sort of a, a scarring effect or kind of a flattened look. There we go, just a tiny bit right there. Let me toggle that on and off for a moment. There's our before, there's our after. It looks a little flat so I'm going to lower the opacity down just a little bit. All right, let's do one last thing to this image before uh, I switch gears here. Uh, again, I talk about masks a bit. I talk about adjustments quite a bit. Um, I'm going to do something else in the same exact uh, manner in which I applied this curves adjustment. This time, just for the sake of uh, variety, I'm going to use levels. And I'm just going to uh, simply drag my lightness slider to the left. Um, I'm focusing on the eyes right now. What I want to do is I want to add a little sparkle to the eye. Uh, I'm not concern with what's happening anywhere else on the image again because I'm going to use the mask uh, to conceal the adjustment that I just applied. Now right now this layer mask is white. I want to fill it with black. I want to do the exact opposite of what I did with the curves adjustment and I simply want to mask out the entire adjustment and using my pressure sensitive paintbrush essentially cut a hole in the mask letting the adjustment show through. So to do that I can do a couple different things. I could go up under edit go to fill contents using black. I'm going to use a keyboard shortcut here. When you hold down your option or your alt key and you hit the delete key, what happens is it's going to fill your layer, in this case happens to be my mask, with the foreground color, which I, if you'll notice was black. So option or alt delete will fill your layer or mask with your foreground color. So now the adjustments there, it's simply being hidden by my mask. Okay. Incidentally, because I have a mask right above it, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag this levels adjustment up above that curves adjustment just so I don't interfere with the existing mask. And I'm going to focus on the image uh, or on the eye itself right now. And barely touching my pen to the tablet, I'm going to paint with white, revealing the adjustment. Now, take a look at my brushes in my color picker for a moment. You'll see that I have black in the foreground. Because I use masks so much when I'm retouching and enhancing images, what I've done is I've set one of the buttons on my pen to the X key. X will allow me to flip over my foreground and background colors. Now I know you can't see my hand on the tablet right now, but what I'm doing here is I'm simply rolling my pen between my fingers and tapping that back button on my pen, which is the X key, until I've got white in the foreground. I've already got opacity turned on, set to be controlled by pen pressure. And now what I'm going to do is simply come over here on my white layer mask and just gently paint with my paintbrush just a little bit, barely touching my pen to the tablet because what I want to do is, again, selectively uh, apply that adjustment only in the areas that I want. Now I'm inside the eye, just kind of painting a little, little opposite the catch light. I want to add a little glimmer there. I'm going to pan over here to the other eye, same thing barely touching my pen to the tablet. I'm just looking to bring in a little bit of light and accentuate the, the catch light that was already there. 
There we go. If I go too far, all I have to do is flip over my foreground and background color, and I can paint back on that mask. Let's take a look at the mask for a moment. There you go. You can see where I painted there. And let me zoom back out. I think you should be able to see that. And we'll toggle that on and off. So there's our before and there's our after. Just again, very basic technique, very basic application of pressure sensitivity with an adjustment layer to enhance that image. I'll, I'll go back down here. Let's take a look at the uh, original image. Holding down my Option or Alt key, I'm going to tap on the visibility icon. There's the before, there's the after. So again, pressure sensitivity is really the basis of the, the couple different tools that I use there. My pressure sensitive paintbrush, uh, as well as the uh, pressure sensitive spot healing brush. Now, I talked about this pen, I talked about how I set up the back button of the pen, I talked about the touch ring, but I really didn't talk about these express keys yet. Um, the express keys, if you recall, are those buttons, those physical buttons on the tablet that can be assigned common keyboard shortcuts. And as I'm looking here, I see that I don't have my tablet control panel open, so let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to show you the tablet control panel temporarily to give you an idea as to how easy it is to set up some of the buttons on your pen as well as the tablet. Now, depending on your platform, whether you're using Mac or PC, uh, you'll find your tablet control panel in a couple of different areas. I'm using a Mac OS today, so I found it under my system preferences. Once you get to the control panel, regardless of what platform you're on, it's going to look very similar to what you see on your screen here. So right now, I have my pen selected, my grip pen, uh, as well as Photoshop. Now, you may recall that I said that you can assign application-specific settings to any feature on the pen or the tablet. All you simply have to do is add the application as one you wish to customize. In fact, if you look in this row right here, you'll see that I've got all other, I've got Photoshop, and I've got Illustrator. So I simply added these applications by clicking on this plus sign right over here. It shows me all the applications that are running, in which case I had Photoshop running, and then when I clicked OK, essentially what it did was add Photoshop. Now I had already added it there, so nothing happened, but you'll notice that as I toggle back and forth between all other, you'll notice to the right of my pen where it says right click and double click, those are those defaults I mentioned. When I select Photoshop, you'll see that they both changed. The front button of my pen I've set up for the Option or the Alt key. The back button I've set up for the X key, which again allows me to toggle my colors. All I had to do to set that was simply tap on the drop down menu next to the button, select keystroke, the dialog box pops up, it would look for me to enter the keystroke, this is what it would look like if nothing was assigned. I'm going to hit X on my keyboard and I'll simply name, all the, name this toggle colors. Still having that spelling problem today. There you go, toggle colors. And I'll go ahead and click OK. Now, anytime I hit that back button within Photoshop, it's going to toggle my colors. It's the same exact function, or I should say, it's the same exact thing when you're looking at express keys under functions. That's going to be where you find your express keys and your touch ring controls that I mentioned earlier. Same exact thing. Select Photoshop, and you'll see in almost every case, I've set up my express keys for keystrokes. Now, these happen to be my particular keyboard shortcuts, the things that I'm doing most often when I'm retouching and presenting and so on. I like to toggle my tools, uh, meaning my palettes and panels, on and off. So with a simple click of a button, I can do that. Uh, I like to change my screen mode. I like to get everything out of the way. I duplicate layers, I create new layers all the time, um, and unfortunately I undo a lot. So that was by far the, the, the first express key that I set up. And actually, you know, let me take a look at that one for a moment. So as I've clicked on the check bar on the uh, drop down menu where it says keystroke, that dialog box opens up. Now you'll see this right up here. Really what this button does for me is, is not just undo to be uh, um, uh, perfectly accurate. Uh, what it does is it actually steps backwards. Meaning, uh, rather than undoing one step or stepping backward one step, it will continually step back through my history states each and every time I hit that button. So that's a, a three key stroke function. That would be Command Option Z or Control Alt Z in Windows. So all I had to do here was hit Control uh, Command Option Z, and then I just named it Undo, and I clicked OK. And now you see it says that right down there. 
Now I'm going to move this out of the way for a moment. And I'm going to tap back over to Photoshop. I'm going to hit one of the buttons uh, on my tablet. And as I look down at my tablet, I realize I'm not going to do that <laughs> because what I was going to say is I was going to hit one of the buttons on my tablet that I had set to show settings, uh, but I, I didn't have it set to show settings, so I'm actually going to do that. So now I'm going to move that out of the way. And now I'm going to hit the button that says show settings. Now what you're seeing on your screen right now is a little heads up display. My, uh, when you use this button, set the show settings. Uh, what it does is it grays out your screen a little bit, it gives you a little illustration of your express keys and your touch ring, and it'll show you what it'll do within the application that you're using. So for example, you'll notice up here where it says, um, it says screen mode, duplicate layer, uh, down on the bottom here I've got this thing called radial menu, new layer, precision mode, display toggle. So all of these individual preferences are, are really up to you. It's all about how you use your favorite applications. So keep that in mind. Uh, think about the things that you do most often when you're within your favorite apps. And the same holds true for uh, literally any, any aspect of the application you're in, such as a plugin as well. So with that, uh, I'm going to bring this uh, dialog box or my control panel back up here uh, for one more moment, and then I'm going to ask Brian to step in. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Brian's going to be talking about the practical use and, and the creative use, really, of a tablet within the Perfect Photo Suite and show you some of the pressure sensitive functionalities that it incorporates. But to wrap up right here with the uh, tablet control panel, you know, for many people, simply getting a tablet, taken out of the box, installing the driver is, is really the extent of their setup. And if, if that's you, I really think you're missing out on a lot, of, uh, a lot of productivity gains to be had. Consider setting up just one express key today. If you've got a tablet, if you're thinking about getting a tablet, when you do, set up undo. Do that alone and see what you think. I think what you're going to find is that over time, you'll find yourself using keyboard shortcuts repetitively, and you'll think to yourself, you know, if I just had to use one button instead of like two or three on a keyboard, that's going to really increase my productivity. And you'll find that it does, and you'll find that adding another key here and there will further increase your productivity. So that said, I'm going to uh, switch gears. I'm going to take a couple of questions right now. Well, actually, I should say this. I'm going to ask a question, and I'm going to uh, take some questions. So with that said, I'd like you folks to do me a favor. I'm going to throw out a, a little poll here. I'm curious to know uh, who exactly is using a tablet. And if you do uh, have a tablet, I'd love to know which one. So I'm just going to throw this poll out there. And if you could do me a favor, just by clicking on one of those boxes, or one of those little buttons, uh, I'll get an idea of who's using a tablet and, uh, and who isn't and who's thinking about it. Excellent. I'll give you folks just a, a couple more moments there to uh, respond. Excellent. All right. A lot, a lot, a lot of Intuos four users out there. Fantastic. Good deal. If you'd like to see what uh, if you'd like to see what you're using, I'll go ahead and close this poll up. Oh, a couple last minute voters there. I'll go ahead and close this up, and I'm going to share this with you guys. I think you'd be interested to know this. Um, we've got uh, people all over the board there. You know, Intuos 4 absolutely is our most popular tablet. Uh, of course, we do have uh, other Intuos tablets. You can you can imagine that Intuos 4 uh, <laughs> came after Intuos 3, <laughs> and so on. But um, regardless, again, what your tablet you're using, uh, I think you're going to find that pressure sensitivity is going to give you a level of control that you, you just simply can't get in any other way. So that said, I'm going to go ahead and uh, close, this, uh, close these results, and I'm going to ask Brian to come in and uh, take over. I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to make him the new presenter here. And as he does that, as he does that, I'm going to take just a couple of questions until Brian can get set up. Uh, and that I will thank you and talk to you folks in just a few more moments. Uh, let's see here. Awesome. You, have you, uh, hey, Joe, have you, have you left anything for us to, to answer? Okay, that's okay. Joe, Joe is muted, which which is the way we like him. <laughs> and by the way, I, I, I like to bash Joe back there. I, you know, I, I I apologize. I hadn't introduced Joe. Tech Man Joe is joining me here today from Wacom. Uh, if anybody's attended a Wacom webinar in the past, you, you're probably familiar with Joe. Uh, he's the man by, behind the curtain at times, uh, and then the man who's also doing a lot of the presenting as well. So Joe's been answering a lot of your questions in the background. But, there were uh, a few questions. That uh, that I can bring up, Wes. That maybe you can talk to. Um, yeah, go for it. The first one, and this is something that I'm, I think I know the answer to. But let's say, so I have 
two 30-inch displays, which just means, forget about the size, I have two displays. Um, can you map the tablet to one display? Uh, just that's a blanket question. Then can you do it per application? Yes, absolutely. That, that's a, it's a fantastic question, and um, uh, it's, it's something that pertains, obviously, to only those users that are using two displays. Uh, if you recall, when you're using a tablet, it works in this absolute mode, so meaning wherever you put your pen on the tablet is exactly where your cursor will appear on your display. So, for example, everybody, if you're looking at your screen, which I assume you are, you can see in Brian's control panel up there, uh, there's a little illustration that shows how his tablet is mapped to his display. If you were using two displays, essentially what happens is your tablet is has this little imaginary line right down the center, where one half of the display maps to the left and one half to the right. There's a button on the tablet, one of the express keys, that can be assigned to something called display toggle. What that button will do will toggle between, as you can imagine, uh, it'll toggle your cursor between one display, the other display, or both displays. It's, it's a little bit difficult to wrap your head around without a visual. I actually have a visual if we have time at the end. Perhaps I can show you folks. But um, display toggle is a feature in the tablet control panel that you're going to want to take a look at if, in fact, you're using dual displays. So hopefully that clears something up there. Uh, if not, we'll, we'll see if we can address it towards the end, Brian. Sure. And I, I saw a question earlier about, you know, can this work for left-handed people or right-handed people? And I kind of chimed in there being a left-handed person or, you know, writer myself. And absolutely, um, you can toggle. So here's your little tablet right here. And by default, it's on the left. So this is for right-handed people. And now what I did was I screwed myself because... What <laughs> I was just going to say, you have to flip your tablet over. <laughs> yep, it inverts the directionality. But the point is that um, I don't want... If I'm writing with my left hand, my kind of palms over here, um, I don't want the button... I don't want my arm covering my express keys or my touch ring. So by inverting it, it kind of maps it for left-handed use. It's, it's absolutely fantastic just how intuitive it is. Um, and then... There was a question, Wes, you feel free to talk about it, and it was a common question. So if you, I wish you could see my arm right now. My, my arm is kind of right over here. So part of my hand is actually on the active area. Um, people are wondering, does that interfere with the pen itself? Like, you know, do I have to keep my hand or my arm over or off of the tablet? Sure, that's an excellent question. No, you, you're actually not even hurting it at all. In fact, I, I oftentimes, uh, when I'm working live with someone, I, I literally have them bang their hand on the tablet <laughs> just to demonstrate that you, know, you don't have to be timid with this thing. The pen tip is the only thing that's going to move your cursor on the Intuos 4. Uh, simply resting your hand on the tablet isn't going to affect uh, any movement of your cursor or the tablet's operation. Cool. Yeah, and that's exactly it. I mean, oftentimes I'll have, if I want to work on the right part of my screen, my arm is over here on the tablet, and I'm, you know, my pen tip is over here. So it's, it, it, there are a few, you know, there were a few people that asked, how should I start with this? And everyone has their, their kind of best practices. And one of mine is um, put the mouse away for a couple of weeks. You know, that's what I did. When I first got my tablet, uh, I, I started with an Intuos 3, and I'm, that's how I'm going to start, Wes, is I'm gonna just going to do a little anecdote um, yeah, about my, my experience with tablets. Um, I first came into the Wacom family with an Intuos 3 about a month before the Intuos 4 came out. Um, and in that time, uh, you know, I learned to, you know, not, not just like or love the tablet, but become reliant on it. Um, so much so that I have two of them. I have one large one for my production machine and one medium size, which is what Wes was talking about, that is about the same exact form factor uh, as a 15-inch like MacBook Pro. It literally hu hugs that size, so when I'm traveling, it just slides into my laptop compartment with the laptop. And the reason why I went to from the 4 to 3, like a month later, I bought a brand new into as far I sold my three was for me the um, having the active display next to the express keys is a godsend um, I actually with my Intuos three I would use a little label maker and print out in tiny little labels you know PS for Photoshop and then dash uh, you know undo <clears throat> and to have those displays um, change on the fly with whatever is listed here and just to show Wes, I also everything I do here is keystroke in Photoshop. Now this is my my kind of product, my uh, 
presenter machine. So if you were to see my production machine, my Mac Pro, I have I don't know how many applications. It's ridiculous. Um, one of the nice things about that I want to bring up with the Intuos 4 is you have the ability to back up your settings and restore them. So let's say you, you know, I just re rebuilt my machine. One of the things I always do is I back up my Wacom preferences files and then I can just restore them on my, when I rebuild it so I don't lose anything, which is for me a huge deal um, because it's that important. So having that for me is huge. You'll also see here I uh, have shortcut keys to photo tools and focal point when I'm in Photoshop. To Wes's point also, um, when I'm in Photoshop on my pen, if I go to the pen button, I have two different undos because there are two undos. In Photoshop, there is the um, command option uh, Z to go back more than one state. But a lot of other, most applications, it's just command Z. You're not going back multiple times. Or if you do, command Z will do that. So I just have undo and PS undo. And if you go to the keystroke, you'll see there, there's my keystroke. So, um, you know, it's extremely customizable what you can do all the way down to the actual product. So this is something that Wes kind of opened up saying most people take the, the tablet out of their, the box, connect it um, or pair it up if it's a wireless model and just use it. And that to me is such a shame because you're really not getting the benefit out of this device. Um, to me, Someone asked earlier when Wes was illustrating how you should position your um, your keyboard and your mouse or in, in relation to your display. And the way I have it, someone asked, well, I have a keyboard tray. Um, what should I do there? Well, that's exactly what I have. I have a, a, a nice big desk and it's got a nice keyboard tray. Um, when I'm working where I'm working on the um, using my tablet, my keyboard goes essentially behind or on the level above the the tablet. So the tablet, is on its own layer and my goal is to reduce the amount of times that I have to actually move my hands to the keyboard so I know what my most common settings are if you go to the functions here um, in Photoshop I can access photo tools and focal point and I'll show you how to do that in from within Photoshop I can duplicate a layer which I do pretty often I can stamp visible which Candace on the line here will can relate to if, if you see the keystroke for it's a it's a we call it the claw it's a command uh, option shift E or control alt shift E which essentially uh, takes a snapshot of all visible layers and creates a new layer I use this extremely often so I just created a, a shortcut key um, then I'll do a quick select these here on the bottom are tools these are my most used Photoshop tools and the save key quick select healing brush clone stamp I use them all the time and then save just because I want to be able to save when I'm done on my production machine I've got uh, apps for Lightroom uh, for for everything actually just about any app that I use even things like uh, Adium which is my instant messaging app I have shortcut keys um, so to me it's very very important um, and we can have a I mean a webinar just on shortcut key best practices uh, because to me that's that's fun so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna open up uh, I have a little finder we know just prep three images and I'm gonna drag one into Photoshop and we're gonna work on it now I worked on this image on a previous webinar, um, but I wanted to bring it here. Actually, I chose this about what it maybe was an hour, hour and a half before the webinar. Uh, Wes and Joe and I were just doing kind of a dry run, and um, I, he saw uh, this image, but it had a, a tilt shift look to it. And you know, how, he was like, "How do you do that?" And so I showed him. And actually, there are ways uh, by using my uh, Intuos 4 tablet that you know that play directly a role in this shot. So what I'm going to do here is I want to actually create kind of a miniature tilt shift look. And so I'm going to do that by going to focal point. But before I do that, I'll show you how you can go into focal point without actually uh, using the uh, on one palette or going to file automate. It'll require you to um, create a keyboard short shortcut to the uh, instance, which is over here, file automate. And there's focal point. And you can see here, I already created my crazy little shortcut keys because Photoshop has a thousand and one different shortcuts already I just had to pick something that was I, I knew Adobe would not have reserved because I don't like overriding shortcuts so to do that we'll go to window or rather to, yeah to window workspace and then go to keyboard and shortcuts so this is something I think that a lot of people overlook um, what you'll want to make sure of is 
by default, you go to the menus option. You want to click on the tab to the left, which is keyboard shortcuts. And essentially what this is, is it's a snapshot of what you see in Photoshop up here. So I'm going to go again. So it was under file. Let's scroll down. There's automate. So I know I'm getting there. And then we'll scroll down. So we start seeing our products here. And then, okay, where's focal point? It is right there. So I can select the keyboard shortcut and you can uh, choose whatever you want. If that's the nice thing about Photoshop is if you do select a keyboard shortcut that is already bound to another function, it will tell you that and it will give you the option to overwrite it. So I have focal point of photo tools, my two most used products in the perfect photo suite set to hard to these keyboard functions. And then what I can do is I can go to back to my Wacom preferences. I'll go to Photoshop and then under the functions, you can see that I have um, up here photo tools. If I go to the keystroke, I basically map the keyboard shortcut that I just created. So now with one click, I can get to it. So over here, I'm just going to hit the respective express key for focal point. And there we go. Let me reset everything here. So for those of you that may not be familiar uh, with focal point, focal point allows you to create a kind of simulate a shallow depth of field as if you shot with a fast lens, but it also allows you to change your plane of focus as if you were shooting with a tilt shift lens. So you've got this focus bug, this little critter over here, and you can see the body is circular and it's got little legs and a little antennas. For these purposes, I'm just going to use the legs. And if I tug at the legs, I can change the size and the shape and the orientation. So there's nothing new here, especially if you are a, you know, a routine on one webinar a viewer, you've seen this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to change the shape of the bug from round to planar, which changes the body from a circle to a square. And this will allow me to create a new plane of focus. So I'm just going to kind of put my uh, focus bug over the plane, the intended plane, which is basically the highway. And this is in Portland, Oregon. And it's one of the benefits of getting to visit the on one home offices that I get to go shooting in the name of work. So here, what I want to do is I want to change the plane right now. Now look at the kind of grid pattern. It's for the most part perpendicular, straight lines up, straight lines across. It's slightly uh, diagonal because my focus bug is slightly angled. But what I want to do is I want to change that plane. And to do that, I'm going to actually put the cursor in the body of the bug, and I'm going to press and hold on the Option key for a Mac or the Alt key on the PC, and I'm going to drag upward with my stylus. And here we go. Now we've kind of created somewhat of this miniature look by changing the dire directionality and quality of the blur. I'm also going to drop the amount of blur just a little bit so that it doesn't look too, too obvious. And I'm going to boost the optical quality so it brings back a little bit more. It, it basically sharpens the bokeh area. But here's where, um, for me at least, my um, Wacom tablet comes in and plays kind of an extremely important role. You may notice that in a lot of our products, you'll see under the brush, the respective brush palette. So in uh, photo tools, it would be the masking brush. You've got these two checkboxes. You've got um, a checkbox for a Wacom Controls brush size and a check checkbox for a Wacom Controls opacity. Now this is directly uh, re relative to the masking brush or the focus brush. In focal point, you're not. Re we don't want to call it masking, even though that's what you're doing. We kind of want you to think in terms of focus and blur. So you're painting focus in or you're painting blur in. So what I want to do here is I could use both at the same time so that the harder I press on my Wacom tablet, because as Wes made it perfectly clear, the Wacom tablet, the Intuos 4 is pressure sensitive. So if I press lightly on it, um, the size of the brush will be uh, smaller and then the opacity will be lighter. And the harder I press, the the same respective change will occur with the brush size and the opacity. For me personally, I use my touch ring. So you can see here, I basically use these two options, brush size and auto and my zooming. So with brush, I don't want the pressure sensitivity to control my brush size. It's totally uh, you know, a matter of taste. It's subjective. There is no right or wrong. I can just use my touch ring to go big or small. So I've got my left hand on the active area of the tablet my right hand on my touch ring, and I do this very often. What I do is I'm going to use the brush pressure sensitivity to control the opacity or the strength of the focus brush. 
what I want to do is I want to gradually paint focus on this road over here because I like having it in focus and I also want to get a little focus on this bottom road. The way the opacity works is this. At its hardest strength, if I press down my pen on my tablet as hard as possible, it will go to whatever this brush opacity slider is set at. So if I want my brush to never exceed half strength, I will put it at 50%. So the, if I press hard, as hard as I can, it will only only paint in 50% opacity. Um, with focal point, though, I like to have my blur, my focus brush, meaning I'm painting focus, about 35. What this gives me the ability to do is very softly, you see how the slider goes down, and the harder I press, it goes up. It lets me paint focus in very, very slow amounts. Now this stroke is iterative, meaning every time I pick the pen up off of the tablet and put it back down, it brushes in again. So it's in iterations, which is great. So I'm going to do this and I'm adjusting my brush here and I'm kind of painting a little bit harder on the uh, pole over here and on the car. I just want to isolate the car more than anything else. And so you see how the sensitivity is controlling, but it's not getting too far ahead because I limited how far pressure sensitivity can go. Now I can go here, let's say I want a little bit more opacity on the bottom. I'll just adjust the opacity and I'll press really hard down. You see how the bus starts to snap in, but I can control the focus on either side of the bus by just pressing lightly. And this to me, with focal point above any other product, this is, for me, it pays back with dividends because it is very hard. Once you paint too much focus, and it's like, oh man, I want to paint some blur back. It, for some reason, it just never matches up right. So you could change this, and we can drop the, the blur amount. So let's say I want to paint a little bit of blur over here. It, a lot of times, you kind of end up not getting that same match. So by limiting how much focus you can paint in at any given time, you really have total control. And you know that, all right, based on the fact that with my pressure, if I want even less focus, I just brush lighter. And you can see the slider is moving appropriately based on the pressure. So that is one way. And let me, let me just fix this up really quick. Oh, I'm actually painting blur. So let me just paint focus and just restore some of that focus back in here. And this gives you the ability to kind of stack focus. So it's not you know, in focus, out of focus. You get a nice kind of gradual transition. And you can see here, if I show my mask, watch, I press down hard or I press down light. It's very, very faint. But you see iterations? As I press down, it's getting closer and closer to black. Whatever is pure black will be in total focus. So this gives me that ability to kind of really, you see how soft that is? That to me is fantastic. You can't really get that with a mouse because the mouse, as soon as you click on the button, it's going to go straight, straight to 28% or whatever it is. What I also find, and this is going to kind of be a best practice to those people that I know how they use our products, a lot of times I find that people don't even touch the opacity of the brush. They leave the opacity at 100%, and that could be very, very daunting. However, with the opacity controls by Wacom, even if that's the case, I can brush very, very subtle amounts. So let's say there's a building here. I just want a little bit of it in focus. I can just paint it in in very, very small amounts. And I actually like that. I actually like that a lot. See, I get carried away, Wes. When I, whenever I'm doing my webinar, sometimes I'll, I'll work on something. I'm like, oh, man, I like that. And I'll start continuing on, you know, at the demerit or detriment of the attendees. But I think you guys, you know, appreciate what I'm saying here is that it's really all about if you're going to set it at 100%, make sure you turn this on. So I'm going to cancel out here, and we're going to go on to another example of how I I always use my tablet. Um, go to the Finder. I'm going to go to my little Staten Island image, and I don't think I've ever actually posted this shot yet. So this is um, a shot. Oh no, I did post it. This was a shot that um, I took uh, near my parents' house on Staten Island on South Beach, and I was experimenting. You know, I spent all this time, a couple of years, doing exclusive HDR work, high dynamic range photography, where I was trying to wrangle in as much detail as possible, in all tone, uh, make sure that you can see highlights and shadows properly, and that's the amazing thing about photography is that you might think that starting at HDR is like starting at the tail end of photography, 
which in my case it kind of wasn't. What I was doing is I was actually evolving by regressing. So I'm like, all right, now I want to see how little I can display. How what what can I do to just give you the bare minimum? So I took this shot. It's a long exposure shot. Um, I found this little seven up can and I positioned it right here. It had this little ribbon. Now here's one of the nice things is I can zoom in with my touch ring, and then just use I can bind um, the space bar to one of my pen uh, either my pen button or to the express key, and just without even taking my hand up. I could just pan around. So this little 7-Up can did have this weird ribbon in it. I thought it had a lot of character, so kind of like a little flotsam that you find on the beach. So I positioned it over here, and I like the lines that you get, and I like this little uh, pier over there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into Photo Tools, and we're going to do what I consider to be, or I'd like to consider to be, tasteful selective color in a black and white image. So I don't even need to double click here because I've got the Photo Tools button bound to an express key. I'm going to launch Photo Tools. Here we go. So Photo Tools is another product of the Perfect Photo Suite family. It's a collection of over 300 different effects. Some effects are for style, and some are effects are for color, or not color for style uh, for a correction rather. So like a portrait, you want like kind of Wes was doing uh, in terms of kind of correcting the skin or smoothing the skin out. We have effects that are specifically built for that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the black and white treatments and I'm going to convert this into a uh, black and white image. So I'm going to add this black and white tasty glow and now we're starting to get a nice kind of black and white image. What I'm going to do is I want to bring back some of the original color in the 7-Up can and the ribbon. But here's the, what I find a lot or here's why I do think that uh, selective color in black and white images gets a bad rap because it does get a bad rap. A lot of times people will just take their brush Let's turn off opacity control. Let's turn our brush to 100%, and let's just restore the original color of the um, Seven Up can. So it's really, really harsh, and it just stands out immediately. And to me, I don't. I'm not a fan of this. I'm not a fan of this really at all. I kind of like very, very subtle color. The Seven Up can has a very distinct color, and that ribbon, as you can see, has a very distinct color, especially when you play it against the monotone, monochromatic background and foreground. So let's undo that. Let's add that effect back in. Except this time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on my same option, Wacom Controls Opacity. I'll leave it at 100%. I don't even mind that. And so what I'm just going to do is just very, very subtly, very, very subtly, just paint in that color. It's almost not detectable, but let me tell you something. When you see it printed or when you see it um, outside of the interface, it is really really nice and you, you could see I hope you could see let me show the mask look how subtle that is now what I would have to do otherwise is I would have to drag it over here down paint it in and if I need more I'd have to drag it up and you, what you're doing is every time you're doing that you're compounding your stroke this way by keeping it at a hundred percent but by maintaining control of the opacity I can very very subtly add that mask in so I'm gonna hide it and I can show you and if I need a little bit more here, I can. The nice thing is also we have total feather control. So if you want to minimize bringing color of the sand, just increase your feather. And for those of you, let me bring the brush size up, and I'll keep it here in the black area. For those of you that may not be familiar with feathering with a masking brush in Photo Tools or in Focal Point, you see that inner circle. That inner circle is kind of the hard active area of the brush. Anything really inside that um, inner circle, your mask will apply at whatever the brush opacity is. So if it's at 100%, it's going to uh, mask out at 100%. The key is with the feather, the distance from the inner circle to the outer circle, that's a transition area. So watch, if I show the mask and I put it here and I press down hard, do you see that transition from the inner circle to the outer circle? That is transition. Now watch what happens if I take the feather away and I press hard no feather. So this is a perfect concept and I hope you guys could have could see basically I had to press down pretty hard and also to kind of answer preemptively you can control how sensitive the pressure is if you go to the back to the Wacom preferences um, and you go to the pen right here the tip feel soft, soft to fir firm so this will control how sensitive the pressure sense or how sensitive the pressure sensitivity is um, of the 
palette. So here, if you go and just press, well, let me press down lightly. See how it's kind of getting darker? To me, it, that is worth its weight in gold. As a as a you know photo geek who absolutely loves gear, that was one of the things that sold me on my Intuos was the pressure sensitivity. Um, and then with the four, the touch ring and the um, the hot displays on the express keys, I mean that that made it worth it. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to uh, paint in. I'm going to turn off uh, the capacity just to get rid of that area so we can see the image again. So again, here we go. We've got, I was like, why isn't my zoom key working? And that's because I was on scroll or on zoom and I wanted my brush size. So that's, that's one of the things I love. I just press the inside and I can go here and without taking my hands off of my tablet, I can, I can just paint. Let's say I want a little bit more color here. I'll just kind of brush it in. No problem. And I have absolutely no feather, which is dangerous. So there we go. That's another example of selective color. I think you'll agree that it's a pre when it's very subtle, especially because uh, this can itself was already kind of uh, uh, sun bleached. So the, the, it wasn't as kind of bright. I wanted to retain some of that. Um, and, I, and you can even argue that if you want, at an even smaller amount, just very subtly bring back a tiny bit of sand color. Well, that was too much. I pressed too hard. The the point is that don't just assume that oh, I'm just going to mask in. You, you don't have to take it at face val value. You can be very subtle with masking. And to me, that's the sign of a real nice kind of digital photographer or digital stylist is the ability to utilize masking uh, in subtle ways, uh, artfully, tastefully, and stylistically. So I'm going to cancel out of here. Now I'm going to show you an image that I really didn't want to even show, but it just... I, I think it has good principles. Um, this is my buddy Doug. Doug is a fantastic Boston-based wedding photographer, uh, and he's a very good friend of mine. And Doug calls me up one day this past winter, a couple months ago, on what had to be one of the freaking coldest days I can remember. And he's like, I've got a challenge for you. He's like, let's go out, one camera, one lens. Um, he's a portrait photographer. I don't do portraits. I'm a landscape you know, kind of urban and architecture photographer. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't do people. He does people. He doesn't really do landscapes. So he said, I'm going to build, I'm going to shoot an HDR landscape image. You're going to shoot a portrait. And so we went out and it, it, you know, as quick, it basically it was a timed event. It was a challenge. How fast can we get into an area that we're not comfortable with? So I have strobes, I have modifiers, umbrellas and stands. I have to dig them out, you know, shake the dust off of them put fresh batteries into the into the speed lights and we headed out. And so this was a shot I quickly took. It's a with a 7200 lens. Um, I intentionally kept the background here because I like the play over here. But what I don't like is I'm not really a fan of this um, snow. I like the blur back here, but I'm not happy with this area here. And I tried already masking it, but I, I wasn't happy with the results. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually send it. I've got a channel saved here, uh, a selection that I'm going to load. I actually just did finish, I just made the selection probably five minutes before the webinar started. And I realized that I have Doug's jeans that I need to select over here. Oh, I need to select my quick select brush. Let me get, oops, wrong button. And that's the other thing I can with, I have on my express, on my pen, one of the two buttons I have set to option, which essentially, option does two things for me that are very important. Option will turn, let me make the brush size larger. You see that plus in the middle of my um, quick selection brush? When I press option, that turns to minus, which means I can remove. The other nice thing is with the clone stamp, uh, option is what you use to sample an area that you want to clone. So there you see how it turns into a target. I can quickly, without picking my hand up, just press on any area and start cloning. So for instance here, let me deselect here. Let's say I want to get rid of that logo for copyright reasons. Boom, do that, and then just quickly get rid of that area here and let's say you know this little reflective area I don't know if that's his skin or something but I want to get rid of that there gone so I do that very very often um, let me reselect that channel here because 
And we have webinars that I specifically go over why I make this selection of focal point, but the long and the short of it is focal point will work on whatever is selected. So in this case here, everything but Doug is selected. I'm going to go into focal point again. I keep um, going to the focal point menu just because I do all these webinars, but when I'm working on my, by myself, I always use my shortcut keys. What I'm going to do is I'm going to reset everything. My goal here is to um, blur out just this area here. And you can see I pretty much already got that, even just with this. Because Doug is selected, he's in focus. The background, I can control just how much of that goes further out of focus. But that's fine for me right here. What I can also do is I can use this to brighten up. Actually, let me change it to planar because it's going to be, it'll look a little bit better. But watch this. I'm going to put the, the planar bug just right here, no big deal. And I'm going to brighten the background and the foreground just a bit because it was a bit too dark, also kind of boosts the contrast. Actually, I dropped it. I like it better dropped. So here's this. Now, where my uh, focus brush comes in with the opacity, and this is super important, more than even masking in photo tools, I'd say. I have my brush at 100% and I've got my opacity selected so that my Wacom uh, tablet controls it. Right now, for me, this is too, there's, it's too hard of an edge. So what I'm going to do is just very, very softly um, paint and blur so that I get a transition, a smoother transition, because I don't want it to look like I masked Doug onto this background here. I really don't want that to be the case. And I, you guys saw that wasn't the case. So it's important for me to kind of very, very softly make these strokes of, um, of course, I'm doing absolutely nothing because I'm painting focus. So what I want to do is paint blur. See, if I, if I flub, that's one thing I'll catch myself, but I'll also let you know because I'm a big fan of live TV um, and no one is perfect. So here, now I can kind of paint. Uh, I was like, why is it still looking sharp? If I can paint over here and just kind of soften that edge just a tiny bit so that it blends in with the background. You can see how his hat kind of looks much more natural now, like you have a plane of focus. So there we go. That's kind of where, for me, opacity control totally, totally saved the shot because I was trying without it. And I didn't like it. But now what I can also do is I'm going to hit apply, and we're going to bring it to photo tools. Now, like I said, I don't really um, do much with portraits. Uh, part of it is because I'm, I'm red-green colorblind, and I don't know skin tone color very well. So I rely very heavily on like color calibration. I rely heavily on my passport um, by x -Rite. but I do know that I want to make this brighter. Let me turn the clone stamp off because I don't want the uh, preview uh, window to come up. Let's go into photo tools here. Again, I use my express key to go into photo tools, and I want to kind of brighten uh, Doug up a bit, so I'm going to use this uh, basic brush, and I'm going to brighten lighter or brush lighter. Now, any, if, uh, any uh, effect that has a little brush next to it, just means that you have to paint the effect in. It doesn't apply to the image. So I'm going to hit Add to Stack. And again, Wacom Controls Opacity. I'm using my touch ring to control size. And you can see how the size is kind of moving according to the actual graphics, graphical size of the brush. And I'm going to set my opacity to 100% just for, to illustrate. I'm just going to very lightly brush around Doug's head. Now here's the thing. Once I make my selection, you can see if I show the mask, there's, there's my selection. I can control the strength. See how it's kind of very subtle? So if I, even at 100%, because the mask is so soft, I can kind of just very, very softly add a little bit more brightness. To me, this is, this is beautiful. Absolutely gorgeous. Well, not Doug, but um, the, the effect. Although Doug is kind of handsome. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to add an effect called under the stylized effects called Sun Glow. I just want the overall image to kind of pop. So it does, does a nice job, but Doug is looking a little kind of bright and also a little soft. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select my masking brush, the paint out, and I'm going to just draw just a little bit, just to very, very subtly soften that effect. And then the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the basic brushes. Now for, again, I have absolutely no idea. Do not kind of take me as an authority for portrait photography, but 
for those of you that are familiar with my work, I'm a big fan of texture. To me, texture is um, people relate to photography based on light, based on color, uh, and based on the actual composition itself. One of the things that are, is most important to me is also texture. Uh, there is, a, I want to ha the viewer to have a tactile response without knowing it. Like I want the viewer in their fingertips to be able to kind of picture what that kind of five o'clock shadow should feel like. So there's a wonderful brush called brush more dynamic range that we can add here because f this does not work well on a female model. Um, I'm just saying that you don't typically paint texture into a female's face. You kind of soften it. Men are a little bit more rugged and you kind of want to accentuate that, especially if the male model already has stubble or a beard. So I'm going to paint very lightly on the overall face because I want to sharpen it. What I'm also going to do is I'm going to zoom in to kind of get a lot more, uh, um, what am I trying to say, a lot more detail in the eyes. So I'm going to drop the brush size really low and I'm going to press much harder on the eyes. So you can see that you get it snaps in really nicely. I'm going to go back to the view. You can see how his eyes look much, much better. Watch this though. I control. You see how his, it, he's getting even more detail based on the fade slider? But if I was to paint this at 100% the entire way, it would look awful because in my mask, it's so subtle. You can barely see it. It is looking kind of creepy. But um, that 100% really doesn't do that much. When I bring my fade slider up, it doesn't do that much. So I'm going to drop this down a bit. And if I want, if there's too much strength in the eyes, I'll just paint out a little bit because it was a bit, that was a bit wild. And then there we go. So here is our original image. Let me um, hide the uh, palette. There's our original image, kind of flat. And then that's what we were able to do with just really controlling opacity. Also, you know, Wes kind of brought this up on his initial slide. Uh, and I didn't really touch on it, and I'm remiss if I did. I would be remiss if I didn't bring it up. For me, um, I'm one of the clumsiest of oafish, most oafish people you'll ever meet. Um, I it just makes me laugh. Like if there's something that I can get tangled on, um, I will get it tangled on d without a doubt. To that point, also, you know, I was never an artist. I don't draw. I don't doodle because I am very sloppy, and I bring that up a lot on my webinars. Just very, very sloppy with my masking. Um, when I was working, before I owned a tablet, uh, I would use a mouse. And trying to get little edits, little, even if I zoom in, it was always, for me, um, a huge burden. And I'm not just trying to say this. This is the God's honest truth. Um, it was very hard for me. And I would also start experiencing uh, fatigue, arm fatigue, because my entire arm is moving. Here, I can get with, instead of of having all five fingers with my uh, my palm and my wrist and my forearm moving this little device, I have uh, a pen in my hand, which is a very natural reaction. People have grown up with pens in their hands. I know how to hold it, and I can get just the most precise strokes that I need. Also, my entire arm is not moving; just three fingers are moving, or however many fingers you use to hold a pen. Um, so, what that did was also, and the final other thing, and this is just based on, I guess, biology and genetics, I I don't think I've ever seen a left-handed mouse. So I would always have to do my edits with my right hand, and I'm not as precise with my right hand as I am with my left hand. So here I get to use the pen in the hand that I'm most comfortable with, that I'm most precise with, um, to get my edits. And to me, I've been, like I said, I've been looking forward to this webinar for a long time because um, I always take a, my opportunities to share how much this tablet is, how important it is to me, um, because I think it will help a lot of you out there, especially if you, when you did uh, Wes's poll and select that you're not a, an owner. Um, to me, the, it pays back with dividends.